Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on all of us. Open our ears and our hearts and our minds to the revelation of your good news today and every day. Amen. This moment that Dennis just read for us in scripture is one of the most celebrated moments in all of the biblical text. The angel's visit to young Mary. The Annunciation, it is called. There are paintings that depict artists' ideas of what it might have been like to be present for the event, all the way from Botticelli to the maestro himself, Leonardo da Vinci. Not the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. <clears throat> there are statues of this mom momentous conversation that sit in places like the Metropolitan Museum of Art in France. Thousands of churches around the world have some type of stained glass windows in their sanctuaries and naves that depict this moment. There are songs about this event that are dusted off and sung each year during the Advent season. Johann Bach even composed an entire cantata intended to celebrate this one moment in the whole narrative of Jesus' birth. And even Saturday Night Live has offered up a sketch about this moment in Mary's young life. You should watch it. <laughs> this monumental moment in Christendom in extends far beyond Christendom itself into something of a global phenomenon. Christians and non-Christians alike know this story. And I must confess that I am flooded with mixed feelings about that fact. Because the details of this story, the details at face value, are actually kind of sketchy. They're a little troubling. When we examine this moment in Mary's life with a critical eye, there are numerous details in the story that give us pause. As Dr. Will Gaffney so succinctly puts it, there is a moment in the Annunciation story when an ordinary girl on the cusp of womanhood is approached by a powerful male figure who tells her what is going to happen to her body in its most intimate spaces. Well, gosh, when you put it like that, that's a real problem. Now, I know we could argue the, the theological context of the Annunciation. We could discuss whether or not Mary really was a virgin and how creepy it is that we even talk about that thousands of years later. We could wonder aloud about whether God knew that Mary would say yes. Or we could discuss the differences between the patriarchal, patriarchal society of Mary's belonging versus the still patriarchal society of our own belonging. Quite frankly, we could even argue over whether or not this conversation between a celestial being and Mary even happened in the first place, or is it simply an insertion into the narrative of Jesus for the sake of legitimizing his divinity with a virgin birth as skepticism grew? We could do all that. <laughs> In fact, I would love to do all that. So let's talk about it sometime, maybe during the craft advent workshop immediately following <laughs> worship today. Two birds, one stone. But for now, before we get into all of that and go down the theological rabbit hole of what this story might mean, let's just be present to the story. Let's be at Mary's side. Let's imagine what this encounter might have been like for her. Even in the time in which Mary lived, she would have surely cherished her own bodily autonomy. She would have known her body was her own, even if nothing else was. This pronouncement by the angel appears to impinge on that autonomy. And in response, Mary does not say yes right away. Mary asks the rather practical question, 
How can this be? Because she knows that she has not done anything that could make this possible, nor will she. Again, Gaffney says, this is Mary withholding her consent. She has questions, and she has not agreed to this glorious messianic prophecy, not yet. In a world which, we, which did not necessarily recognize her sole ownership of her body and did not understand our notions of consent, this very young woman had the dignity, the courage, and the temerity to question a messenger of the living God about what would happen to her body before she gave consent. That is important. That gets lost when we rush to her capitulation, when we first marvel at her Magnificat, but before Mary said yes, she said, uh, wait a minute, I need you to explain this to me so that I have all the knowledge and all the information that I need to have in order to make an informed decision about my own body. Mary had the opportunity of choice. A close reading shows her presumably powerless in every way, but sufficiently empowered to talk back to the emissary of God, to determine for herself and to grant what consent she could, no matter the one asking. And friends, as a little side note to insert here, this moment when Mary questioned the angel of God before giving her tepid consent, this may be the moment wherein other young women had said no. Did you know there's legend around the invitation to Mary? Legend suggesting that Mary was not the first young woman to ask, be asked to bear the child of God. That she was simply the first one who said yes. If that is true, and we have no way to know if it is true or not, if that is true, the fact that we do not know the names or stories of these other women is no indictment on them, for that is exactly what they chose. If this is true, that others were asked but declined, surely that would support the image of the God that Jesus showed us, who would not force their will upon anyone. Now with all of that in mind, let's go back to Mary's side, the very beginning of her biblical story in Luke. The first time that Mary shows up in the birth narrative of Jesus in the gospel according to Luke. Chapter 1 tells us, an angel appeared to Mary saying, greetings favored one, the Lord is with you. Do not be afraid. Now right away, the angel begins with an impossible ask. Even before we get to the impossible ask about a virgin birth. Be, don't be afraid, this glowing celestial being says to the 12 to 14 year old girl to whom it has suddenly appeared with no warning. Do not be afraid. It's a statement that we read elsewhere in the Christmas story as the angels appear to the shepherds and to Joseph. And yet for Mary in that encounter with Gabriel, I wonder if she would have been human if she hadn't been afraid. Imagine the fear you would experience if a glowing celestial being showed up in your room. Don't be afraid. Even now, it feels like too much to ask of someone not to be afraid in the face of life's difficulties, even without physical angels appearing out of thin air. Nonetheless, did you know that do not be afraid is the most common phrase uttered in all of the Bible? 365 times. Do not be afraid appears in the biblical text, the exact number of days in a calendar year. The amazing author Cole Arthur Riley says, some have interpreted this as an indictment on those who are afraid, as if to say fear signifies a less robust faith. 
God is not criticizing us for being afraid in a world haunted by so many terrors and traumas. I hear, don't be afraid, and I hope that it's not a command not to fear, but rather the nurturing voice of a God drawing near to our trembling, she says. I hear those words and imagine God in all tenderness cradling her creation against her breast. Friends, fear is not a failure of our faith. It is a human response. We are often quick to jump to the Magnificat, the song Mary sings after she has given the yes. We look at her words in that song wherein she sings, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices. And we've been told that surely Mary had no fear. Surely Mary just immediately embraced what God was asking of her and rejoiced in doing so. But Mary was a human child who undoubtedly was afraid even as she also celebrated what God would do through her. Can we hold both of those two competing ideas at the same time? Can we sit with Mary in the dissonance of her plight and recognize that she was capable of being both terrified and proud? We must, because that same dissonance, it's not just Mary's part, They're part of Mary's story, but it's part of the human experience for all of us. How many times have you felt afraid and yet worked through that fear by saying yes to something that terrified you? And on the other side of that, you rejoiced in that yes. Indeed, if we've lived any sort of life, then we know that courage rises despite our fear, not in its absence. And we can be courageous like Mary, despite our own fears, because the same God who nurtured her hopes to nurture us. In her book, This Here Flesh, Cole Arthur Riley writes about her life as she struggles with a neurological disorder that impacts, among other things, her vision. She says that she has holes, these are her words, ripping through her retina. She, at 32 years of age, is slowly losing her eyesight due to rapid disintegration of her retinas. Cole has had several surgeries with the hopes that they can slow down this process of degeneration as much as possible. Her vision issues are only compounded by the illness wreaking havoc on her muscle, causing her muscles to actually atrophy. She writes in her book, there are days, weeks, even months, when she can do little else but lie in bed and hope for tomorrow to be better and to fight off fears of what may come. She tells a story in her book of the day that her sister came to see her right after she received her diagnosis about her impending blindness. Her sister took her face in her hands, looked deep into Cole's deteriorating eyes and said, you will not go blind. I promise you, I will not let you go blind. Cole writes of that moment and says, it's a vow that I rationally know she is incapable of making. Yet, this promise will still hold me if my vision goes and I come to the end of my seeing before I am ready. I do not consider deeply whether her vow will be kept. Rather, my practice is to rest in the love that compelled her to even make such a promise. My friends, fear will come. Anxiety and stress and worry will pierce our spirits as part of the human experience. Our call then is not 
to not be afraid as much as it is to rest in the promise of the love that compels a God to say 365 times in the biblical text, do not fear, for I will be with you. The God of all comfort wishes to remind us of their presence in the midst of those fears. What remains alongside that fear is the call to rest. Do not be afraid. May Mother Mary be our inspiration in the face of our fears, not because she didn't have them, but because she did. And she still said yes anyway. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. May it be so. Amen.